Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk today. And, and hello from frosty Toronto. <laughs> today I'm here to talk about the W3C audiobook specification and about building the next iteration of audiobooks. My name is Wendy Reed and I am from Rakuten Kobo where I am the accessibility and publishing standards lead responsible for all of our accessible digital properties and our publishing standards activity at the W3C. When I talk about audiobooks I always want to talk a little bit about the past and the history of audiobooks and how it relates to how audiobooks have responded to technology as it has changed over its history. The first phonographic book was envisioned by Thomas Edison all the way back when he invented the phonograph in 1877. As technology evolved, audiobooks have always taken advantage of advance of these technological advances to better serve their audience. And I think that understanding the past helps us build for the future. Pictured here is an editorial cartoon from the Daily Graphic in 1878, which depicts a family gathered around a table with a phonograph playing. The caption reads, the phonograph at home reading out a novel. I really love this cartoon because I think it really envisions you know, exactly what people were hoping for when audiobooks were developed. As far back as 1878, it was really seen as an entertainment and a way to bring people together around a wonderful listening experience. And I think we can see that today, though maybe instead of a phonograph, it's a Sonos speaker. The phonograph made the distribution of musical recordings possible. But phonographic books were one of the first use cases that Edison envisioned as a way for blind people to be able to read. From the beginning, audiobooks were specifically designed for people with disabilities. It's important to remember the disability inclusion history of audiobooks because it's something that we can't forget as audiobooks grow to be part of a larger market. The earliest audiobook production programs were actually started as far back as the 1930s by organizations like the American Foundation for the Blind, the Library of Congress, and the Royal National Institute for the Blind as a way to get literature in the hands of people with vision impairments. The change and development of the commercial market didn't come until about the 70s. The cassette tape was first developed in the 1960s but it wasn't until things like Walkmans and cassette decks and cars made owning and purchasing cassette tapes much more feasible and reasonable for the average user. It also made audiobooks a much more appealing option. As people began to spend more time in their cars, having an alternative to music or the radio was increasingly appealing. Some of the earliest commercial audiobooks were about topics like business development and self-improvement. And you know, using famous actors to read audiobooks was also a very early development in the commercial market. Most of the market was mail order, but audiobooks were also available through stores and libraries. As we get to the 90s and the computer age, audiobooks had grown to a $1.5 billion industry. And as things like the access to high-speed downloads, file size improvements, and increased storage, companies like Audible were the first to develop a portable audiobook player, as well as a website from which to purchase audiobooks in the 90s. And it continues from there, with devices getting smaller and smaller, storage sizes increasing dramatically, and data connections more readily available, we now all carry audiobook listening devices in our pockets every single day. And the future is looking pretty bright, with more and more people interested in audiobooks, thanks COVID, and constant technological developments, there are new trends arising. Computer-generated narration, integrated supplemental content, and increased accessibility are all topics that we should be interested in as audiobooks only grows. We also have to think about things like AI, machine learning, and improvements in app development to really see what the possibilities are for audiobooks, but publishing in general. And with all of these things in mind, this is how we got to building a specification. We wanted to build a specification that addressed our present challenges, as well as the future possibilities that we saw in the space. 
We developed the audiobook specification to address issues in the supply chain that we saw after the growth in platforms. Issues like inconsistent metadata, missing files, reading order issues, and more plagued us constantly. We also wanted to acknowledge some of the advances in technology that we saw that would change how audiobooks were consumed. Anyone who's worked in this space in the last few years can likely relate to the frustrations that we tried to address. In taking content from multiple companies, managing differing metadata schemes or file types, these were all challenges we wanted to try and address with a single manifest format that provided the flexibility necessary. We also were aware of opportunities presented by advances. Things like app development, voice technology, and accessibility are all changing year over year. Do audiobooks need to continue to just be audio? Do, you know, can ebooks and audiobooks become a closer format? Can we facilitate affordances like annotations, navigations, and supplemental content in a consistent and user friendly way? These are all questions that we had to ask ourselves. The opening paragraph of the audiobook specification says that an audiobook is a collection of audio resources grouped together by a reading order, metadata, and resources. The audiobook specification is designed to provide a unified manifest for delivering audiobook content through the supply chain from content creator to user. The manifest provides a method for content creators to send their metadata, their content, and their resources in a single format. Here, I just wanna briefly go over each of the sections of the specification without getting too much into what it looks like. Um, you can look at the samples on our website, but it is important to understand how and why the specification is structured the way it is. The first section is the metadata section. In the audiobooks format, our metadata is purely for identification and differentiation. It is separate from Onyx or other retail formats because it is not meant to replace it. <laughs> In fact, it is recommended to use Onyx in conjunction with your audiobook manifest file to provide the rich metadata necessary for sale. Our metadata is purely for telling a reading system or a user agent that this is an audiobook, it has a title, it has an author, it has a language. Uh, here's the important information. In the reading order, this is probably the most important part of the specification. The reading order is a definitive list of the order of files in the audiobook. It is also the place where we keep all of the audio resources. It provides important information to the user agent or the player about things like file size, duration, type, title, and other things like alternatives. This is the bulk of the specification, and this is where most of your content would go. It's also important to recognize that it is a, an authoritative order that allows the user agent to understand without any other input what order the file should be presented in. The resource section is reserved for all non-audio resource files. This could be your cover, table of contents, supplemental content, transcripts, things like that. There's no restrictions on file type in the resource section because of the variety of content that could be included as a resource. We didn't want to get into what are the best for file format types for covers or, oh, should we include PDF and, and EPUB and things like that. We just made it open because we wanted there to be possibilities and creativity in what is included as a resource. Outside of the specification, we have a couple of other uh, features, including packaging. Packaging using the lightweight packaging format allows a audiobook content creator to actually package all of their audiobook into a single file format. This would include the manifest, the audio files, and any resources that are included in the file as well. The packaging format uses zip, which is similar to EPUB for those that know that format, but it has significantly fewer requirements, hence the name lightweight, and it was designed to make it easier to package and move files through the supply chain as previous Delivery formats have uh, definite risks in terms of things like files being lost or corrupted along the way. I also wanted to briefly talk about accessibility. Um, I've mentioned it already in this presentation, but the audiobook specification makes it very important and very clear that it is an accessible format. Making an audiobook accessible is 
very straightforward within the manifest, and we have actually created a few options for creating more accessible audiobooks. Things like including text transcripts, synchronized media formats, and alternate formats allow content creators to be creative and accessible with all of their audiobook content. We also wanted to provide more than just textual alternatives. That is one way to make your content accessible, but it's not the only way. It's important for users to have access to information like the navigation, structure, and metadata to understand what they are listening to and where they are in the audiobook. And this is all available using things like the reading order as well as a table of contents. I also wanted to close out with talking about the future of audiobooks. The specification was released in late 2020 and has gained a good amount of adoption in the time since. The publishing industry is a cautious one, especially when it comes to new technology, but with support for the specification coming from a number of places, it is com its complete adoption is looking promising. I don't recommend releasing a major specification during a global pandemic, but thanks to passionate advocates like some of you here, we have seen adoption in a number of places in the industry, from tool developers to retailers. The specification is also included in places like the Onyx standard, where, which means that content creators or publishers will be much easier, have much easier time distributing their content with the right metadata. I also look to the future. Uh, there's a lot of new possibilities on the horizon for audiobooks, both in terms of how they are produced and with what features. Things like machine learning and voice technology all have huge implications for how we make and distribute audiobooks. I also want us to think about how we can expand our idea of what an audiobook is as the digital landscape only grows, especially with the inclusion of things like transcripts or captioning to make content more inclusive and functional. There's a, there's a lot that can be said about how areas like computer speech or text analysis could open up possibilities for new audiobook affordances especially ones previously limited to ebooks like navigation or annotations. It's exciting to think about all the things that can be done with audiobooks and the specification, and I look forward to seeing them all. I have included here a couple of links to the various specifications I have mentioned in this talk. I also have included a really great book that has informed much of my knowledge of the history of audiobooks. It is The Untold Story of the Talking Book by Matthew Rubery. It is available in both ebook and audiobook format for anyone interested, and I highly recommend it. Thank you so much for listening to my talk today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I hope everyone has a wonderful day, a wonderful time at the conference, and take care. Thanks.